Hello, and welcome to Circulating Conversations, the podcast where we discuss library topics, genre deep dives, and book recommendations. I'm your host, Rachel, an adult services librarian, and this is my guest. I'm Dusty. I'm an adult services supervisor. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's good to be here. All right. So today our topic is going to be Library of Things. Uh, So we'll be discussing the definition of it, uh, going a little bit about the history and evolution, as well as talking about the pros and cons of having one at at, um, your library. So um, what is a library of things? Uh, So it is defined as a community resource that allows individuals to borrow a variety of non-traditional items and tools beyond the typical books and media found in a conventional library. Um, So these libraries will focus on providing access to tangible items that people may need infrequently or cannot afford to purchase. So the goal of it is to reduce waste and encourage people to share resources. Um, Would you say you agree with that definition, Dusty? I do. I think it shows a way that libraries participate and really, I think, are the first ones to to kind of start the sharing economy Mm -hmm. because we're all about just loaning things that people don't necessarily need to own. They just want to use them for a while, learn from them, and then return them. Absolutely. So uh, going into the history of it, um, so the early concept uh, of library things started in the 2000s um, with the concept of sharing resources beyond books, um, gaining traction with the rise of community-based sharing initiatives and tool libraries setting the stage for what uh, would develop into the Library of Things model. Then in 2009 is when the first recognized Library of Things uh, came to be. So that was established in Toronto, Canada. Uh, The initiative focused on lending out tools and equipment for home improvement and gardening, uh, demonstrating the potential of expanding library collections beyond books. Then the 2010s uh, is when it really expanded. Uh, so in 2010, the idea of Library of Things began to spread globally with various communities exploring similar models. Uh, libraries started to include a diverse range of items like kitchen appliances, technology gadgets, and recreational equipment. Then in 2013, uh, the concept gained a more formal recognition as library and community organizations experimented with different types of items for loan um, and continued to broaden Uh, what would be included in the library of things. And then in 2014, we saw a growth in popularity. Uh, Library of things start to become more common in the U.S. and Europe. Notable examples include the San Francisco's public library launch of its library of things program. Then in 2016, we saw increased diversity and community engagement. So... Library of Things begin to diversify their collections, including items like musical instruments, outdoor gear, and technology, um, and many libraries would partner with local businesses and organizations to expand their offerings and enhance their community. Uh, and then we're going to leave off in 2018 with technological integration, um, with the integration of technology and Library of Things become, became more prevalent. Um, Libraries begin using digital platforms and apps for managing inventories, reserving items, and tracking usage. And from your experience, Dusty, being in the library field um, for a long time, how did you see that rise in library things? Well, in this library especially, we started out um, where we would be a pickup point for home water test kits Mm -hmm. and then for a while we would also loan a home electric usage meter so Mm -hmm. people could track how much electricity each appliance was using. Then we branched out into circulating Wi-Fi hotspots and then we branched out even more into some backpack kits that we'll talk about a little bit later for bird watching, stargazing, things like Mm -hmm. that. And now uh, we, under your leadership, we have started a circulating board game collection. Yeah. Um, So was the water testing kits and uh, the the meters the, the first kind of experimentation that this library did with that sort of thing? They were. Mm hmm. Yeah, I remember uh, the water testing kits 
probably came back um, when by the time I started working here, but I don't think I've ever seen the, the meters. Right, that was a while ago, mm -hmm. and I, I, I believe that was a program with the city, um, mm -hmm. or it may have been a county initiative. I'm not right. sure, it's, but it's been a while. Yeah, but everything else you mentioned um, is either still going on or does have the potential to come back, like the water testing kits. Like I said, we have had them since I've been here. Um, we don't have them currently, but who knows, those could come back too. Mm -hmm, for sure. <laughs> um, so now let's talk about the community benefits um, that having a library of things can provide. Do you want to start that off, Dusty? Sure. Uh, again, it's just the having access to these resources. Patrons um, can borrow items that they might not either have the money to purchase or they may not want to purchase them. It's a good way to try something out. Maybe you are interested in learning to play the ukulele or somebody in your family is, but maybe you don't want to invest in a ukulele. Um, so you check one out for a while and you check out a couple of books on how to play them. So it's, if our libraries are just about access to resources, then that fits in perfectly with what we do. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, and expanding on that again, uh, it is cost saving. Um, it reduces individual expenses um, by allowing community members to uh, share resources rather than having to buy on their own. Because um, like you said, there are some things that maybe you just need access to it for a particular reason. Um, and there's no reason for you to spend money to own it for the rest of your life if, if you can just borrow it and get it for free at your local library. <laughs> exactly. And even though it's not part of our collection, there are so many libraries that, as you mentioned, loan out tools. Yes. And they might loan sewing machines. Mm -hmm. They might loan um, older technology like slide projectors or VHS machines. Mm -hmm. So it's just... a uh, it's another way to also just kind of uh, reduce waste because, you know, some of this older technology libraries may not be using on a regular basis, mm -hmm. but it's funny that we do still get calls from people oh, and absolutely. they'll say, do you have just a typewriter? Do you have a slide projector? I've got these VHS tapes that I want to copy do you have a VHS player? Mm -hmm. So um, while libraries may not, again, need that technology on a daily basis, um, and we, we don't want to necessarily become a, a warehouse for, for out-of-date <laughs> technology, of yes. course, but if you have a lending library of things set up, then those are great things to have for people because, again, it's just for occasional and pretty specific use. Right. And I think that goes into, and we'll talk about that a bit more when we talk about um, the challenges that libraries might face um, in getting a library of things started mm -hmm. um, and maintaining one, is about like you really want to cater to your demographic and what they might need right. versus trying to get like every possible thing. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just as we can't get every book for every single reader or every DVD for every viewer, we can't have every object or tool that anybody may ever need. Right. Okay. And continuing with the community benefits, uh, would you like to do the next one? Um, yeah. Um, when we were talking about the maybe the ukulele example, um, there are libraries that not only loan out musical instruments, but then they will offer classes as well. Um, it's possible to have a couple of sewing machines for people to check out, but then also when they're not in circulation, if they're just at the library, you could have that equipment to teach a basic sewing class. Mm -hmm. So it is a way for people to just kind of explore a new hobby or skill, again, without the investment. And with a little bit, uh, the library would be able to provide a little bit of basic training on it. And, of course, we're probably going to have a book or a DVD that will help you with it as well. Yes. 
Um, and, and I think that is something that both benefits uh, the patron as well as the library too because having a program that fits um, with the tools or items that they might lend out also guarantees that there is going to be some, some usage and checkout mm -hmm. of that item. Exactly. Um, especially if it's maybe one that they're seeing that maybe is not getting as much attention uh, if they compare that with a program um, that gets people in um, then they'll, they'll find that usage that they were looking for. Right, sure. Mm -hmm. um, and within the same vein, it just uh, creates opportunities for interactions and collaborations among people. You know, when you, you have a program, uh, it's people getting together and learning something together. So it uh, really strengthens those community bonds mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense for people to want to come to a public library for that opportunity mm -hmm. for collaboration. Um, and, you know, it really encourages people to try some artistic or maybe some innovative projects um, to, again, explore a, a hobby um, or some other creative outlet that they might not have done before because, again, they either didn't have access to or didn't want to invest in the equipment that they need for it. Right. Because hobbies can be expensive sometimes. Yes, <laughs> they can. Yeah. Um, and then also, um, you know, a lot of times when you are uh, building your library of things, you might end up partnering with local businesses, um, so then that's uh, promoting local um, services uh, and products that businesses provide here. So for example, you know, maybe someone at first thought that they had no use for a certain tool um, but then they used it as a library and they were like, you know what, maybe maybe I do have use for this, maybe I do want to own it on my own as well. And then that could provide business for a local business too. Mm -hmm. And you might have uh, business owners who might want to come and demonstrate how to use them yes. as well. So uh, some libraries uh, also loan out technology. I know we, we touched on that a little bit. Um, there are many libraries that where you can check out an e-reader or you can check out a laptop mm -hmm. uh, to use maybe within the library, but some you can check out the laptop to use at home. And there are even kind of vending machines for sale right. for libraries. Um, there's, I read about a library where they, they just don't have desktop computers for the public anymore. They just have a vending machine and people just check out a laptop to themselves and they right. use it and then they return it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's not leaving the library necessarily like some of the other equipment or other library of things items, um, but it still is a different model where it is instead of having equipment out all the time in case someone needs it, you just have it put away, ready to go on demand. Right. And I think some people will be shocked at some of the things that some libraries will have in their library of things. Because, um, for example, you can have some like recreational things like a kayak. <laughs> and <laughs> that might not always be kept in the library necessarily, but you might be able to check it out. Um, through the library, and I think people would never think, oh, I can get a kayak from the library. So, yeah, you can get some really cool things at, at Library of Things. Oh, absolutely. I was um, I was reading a little bit, and there are some libraries in that have snowshoes mm -hmm. for loan, um, frisbees, and fishing gear. Um, and again, I think that's a great opportunity if you have uh, family visiting, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe you just don't have enough gear, then you can just check it out right. for a little bit and then return it and you don't have to store it mm -hmm. or uh, worry about all that fishing line getting tangled up. Right. Um, and then, of course, there is the educational use of these items as well. So, again, this is going back to programming and training, um, you, you might be learning a skill that you didn't have before, and this might encourage people, especially when it comes to tool libraries. Um, for some people, I'm sure, like um, doing home renovations or just, uh, you know, 
kind of like handiwork at home mm -hmm. could be intimidating for them. So one, to be able to get the tools to do that for free and then also have the chance to like learn how to uh, gain those skills too. Um, I'm sure would be great for a lot of people. As a new homeowner myself, there's been a couple of times where I've had to just kind of like, oh, I need to fix this thing, and I kind of just got to figure it out on my own. So mm -hmm. I would just definitely um, love the opportunity to learn those sorts of things too, and I think uh, you can get that a lot when you have that mix of uh, the programming as well as getting the tools together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and as, you, as a new homeowner, you know, you may not have moved in with every single tool that you will need. Right. Um, and if you are moving into a fairly new house, you maybe don't need that. You may not want to have a lot of clutter mm -hmm. um, because tools can, you can build a, quite a collection if you're trying to get a specific one for each specific job that right. you're trying to do. Yeah, I read about a library that uh, checks out plumbing tools so mm -hmm. you know you can check out something that you hope that you won't need on a regular basis <laughs> right. like a drain snake mm -hmm. um, but but you could get one and um, and some basic information on how to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, so now let's kind of uh, switch perspectives because when we were talking about benefits we were really talking about benefits to the community and a little bit to libraries um, but now we're going to talk about challenges and specifically challenges to libraries in kind of building a library of things um, the types of things that they have to think about um, before they want to consider getting one started or things that might limit them from being able to have one or at least an expansive one um, so starting that off Obviously, one of the big, big things is going to be funding. You know, do you have the money um, to start purchasing items? Um, and then, of course, there's going to be an ongoing cost if you want to build it, if anything is damaged, um, maintenance, um, and managing it as well. Because, um, like I said, there are some big ticket items that some libraries have, right. uh, whether it be, you know, uh, equipment like technology equipment or, you know, a kayak's not cheap. <laughs> right. um, so, you know, if that item gets damaged or if something uh, it gets lost or something like that, then being having to be able to, do you want to replace it? Do you expect, you know, the patron to replace it? Right. How do you deal with those costs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in a way, uh, maintaining a collection of a library of things is very similar to maintaining a collection of books, DVDs, CDs, um, you do have to figure out how to, to pay for them and what, uh, what a user is going to be responsible for if they have to replace it. Um, you know, then you have to, you have to maintain it um, and maintain the inventory of it. Right. So um, things need to be barcoded and they need to be cataloged. And so you have to figure out the best way to describe it so that people can find it in your online catalog. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to fall under the Dewey system necessarily, so you're just going to have to have some other kind of category and good keywords so that they're discoverable right. in, your, in your online catalog. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you have to find places to store them. Yes. You know, we're really good at storing flat squarish things mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yes. you know uh, but then where do we put that fishing rod right. or that that kayak um, right. you know or the <laughs> or the sewing machine you know mm -hmm. um, there because this is you know do you put it out on the shelf for people mm -hmm. to see right. so that they know what we have yeah, do um, or do you keep it in the back right. um, and um, so you you have to figure out where to put right. everything. Yes, and that's one of those things that definitely depends on your library, your library system, um, especially like funding and like space. Mm -hmm. That is going to depend on, on your own library. Um, so in addition to that, obviously, again, we talked a little bit about maintenance as well, like our, when something comes back, are we checking it for damage? Um, or, for example, like uh, cake pans, uh, too, you know, is it coming back clean? 
And if it's not coming back clean, uh, do we expect staff to have to clean it then? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, do we put rules when we lend stuff out that mm -hmm. it needs to be cleaned? I can even think about, like, especially if it's items that we're worried about getting damaged that are those more expensive items. Do we have, like, a waiver? There's a lot that goes into how we want to maintain the collection. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and, you know, uh, talking about staff's role in maintaining and repairing items, you would have to train your staff mm -hmm. to do that. Um, now, you know, I think that really a library that wants to commit to a library of things is going to, as you said, kind of know your community and know your audience, but also build on the strengths of staff. Mm -hmm. If you have staff that are musical, that may be where you focus. You know, if you have staff that are a lot of, uh, that are very into DIY, mm -hmm. then you can just build on your staff's strengths. Um, you certainly wouldn't want to force something on your staff um, and make them learn how to, again, use that drain snake if they don't don't right. necessarily want to or how to, you know, how to repair everything on that kayak. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, they may need some additional training just to, to manage these, these, uh, these items um, just so that they can pass that information on to patrons to educate them on their, their proper use. Absolutely. And of course proper use um, takes you into liability. Mm -hmm. um, what, how much um, liability would you want um, patrons to assume? If they're going to check out something very expensive, are you going to, is the library going to charge them the entire price? Right. Are they going to charge them a, a repair fee? Um, and again, there's, there's, there's the liability of the, of the loss or damage to the items and also the liability of the person using it. Yes. Um, so just as with libraries that have maker spaces, they have very strong policies and re uh, require you to sign a liability waiver mm -hmm. when you use it, you may end up having to write liability waivers for some yes. of these uh, some of this equipment that right. you might check out. I, I could think especially when it comes to like the tools, mm -hmm. um, you know, if they lend out a saw, you know, <laughs> you don't want anything bad happening there. Right, so. right. So definitely. Um, and then as well, again, this goes into staff tra training. You have to think about the logistics of um, lending out the items. And, you know, again, uh, do you want them to sign a waiver or uh, something regarding liability? Uh, you know, how long is someone allowed to have it? Uh, does it depend on the item? Um, can they renew? That sort of thing has to go into what you're thinking about. So you have to make like a really strong policy and you really have to think about how, how you want to follow um, the rules to make sure that everything is, nothing's getting misused, everything's being uh, maintained properly. Right, right. So, um, and with the borrowing, just as we have to check any material, when we, when we check it in, then we check, uh, check it for damage and check for its uh, conditions. So those are, those are additional steps that, uh, that staff would have to incorporate in their workflow. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it, it's not easy to do, kind of predict what items are going to be in demand. And so, you know, you don't want to under-purchase something that's popular, but you don't want to over-purchase. Mm -hmm. You don't, but how do you, how can you predict how many fishing poles you really need? Right. Um, so, you know, I think in most cases, of course, libraries start small. Yeah, yeah. And either they start with just a few items in a particular category, um, or they only, uh, collect items that they know that there will be a demand for that they kind of specialize in, like, again, like musical instruments. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, too, um, you might have, just as we have patron suggestions available for, um, 
you know, books, audiobooks, movies, et cetera, you might be able to open that up to uh, the tool library to allow patrons to suggest something that they might want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you see something be requested multiple times, then I think it would obviously be good to consider getting that. Um, or again, you can just think back in your past. Is there something that people have asked for a lot? Like, again, have you had multiple people ask for a typewriter mm -hmm. um, or to be able to convert VHS to DVD or right. something like or that? Or an overhead projector. Yeah, or yeah. an overhead projector. And then you say, well, you know what? We've got that question a lot. Maybe we want that item mm -hmm. um, now that we're building a library of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so th another kind of um, part, another thing that staff would have to sort of be involved in is the, the quality control mm -hmm. of the items. Um, is, you know, if you get items donated to you um, or if they don't circulate a lot and they're not regularly looked at, you have to kind of make sure that everything is going to be working right. and uh, safe, safe to use before you loan it out. Um, and, um, you know, that's, I, I think it's also, just as it's hard to determine the demand for the items, you have to figure out how sustainable it really is. Mm -hmm. um, is it going to be financially sound? Are you going to purchase items? Are you going to accept donations right. at all or exclusively? Because, again, you don't want to end up um, being an antique store, mm -hmm. you know, or, right. or having it look like a, a garage sale. Um, but uh, so, you know, starting, starting small and kind of focused is probably the best way to sustain a program Absolutely. like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you mentioned some of them before, but let's go into a little bit again of what Leesburg Library uh, offers that would be considered under a library of things. Okay. Well, the, the first one is loaning out Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, this is a really terrific service because sometimes you live in an area where your broadband is just not reliable. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have reliable internet access, you are shut out of a lot. And we're not just talking about entertainment. We're talking about doing anything online, right. anything, your work, any schooling, any uh, government applications, any employment applications. Mm -hmm. We just have to have dependable internet. And um, until every region has good dependable broadband, a Wi-Fi hotspot is an excellent way to kind of supplement that yes. so that you have some, some steady internet. Mm -hmm. um, some people also get them for when they're traveling, if they have to work on the road. Um, then they're not always looking for uh, you know, Wi-Fi connections in a, a cafe or using their own data, they've got this hotspot that they can carry along with right. them. Yeah, and I know our hotspots are a, a great commodity. Yes, like, they are. They are well loved. <laughs> yes, they are well loved. Lots, mm -hmm. lots of holds, and they get a lot of use, and they're they're very much appreciated. Yes, um, and then we also have uh, multiple different kind of backpack kits as well. Um, so we have ones like bird watching, stargazing, bugs and insects, um, Florida plants, uh, and all of those comes with uh, some books on the topic um, as well as like, you know, with bird watching you probably get binoculars. Um, so just a nice kit that'll, that encourages a fun activity. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, we've got uh, so much to offer in this area, mm -hmm. uh, so many great parks and state parks and so many opportunities all year round to get outside and learn something different. So that's a really fun kit for a family to check out um, because everything is self-contained and it's fun to go and, you know, watch birds and match them up on the, the little charts and mm -hmm. in the books and um and you're always learning something yeah um you know for years and years we have had jigsaw puzzles mm -hmm. 
to circulate and people love them and that has been a very popular item and actually that probably is the very first thing that was not a book uh-huh. that that we checked out yeah um and um, our latest acquisitions, of course, are board games, and this is your project, Rachel. Yes. And um, so I think you should tell us a little bit about uh, how you came up with the idea and what you see happening with our circulating board game mm-hmm. collection. Yes. Uh, so part of the reason why I came up with the idea is I participated in a program called Sunshine State uh, Library Leadership Institute. Um, And for that, we needed to complete a project for our library. Um, And I was thinking, and I really like the idea of a library of things. Um, But, you know, as you said, you kind of need to start small sometimes. So at first I was thinking about, like, you know, this huge collection, multiple different uh, items to add. Um, But then I decided to just focus on one, and that ended up being board games, because I myself am a a lover of playing board games. Um, And that's obviously a fun activity that, you know, you can just enjoy with friends and family that I think is uh, really great for the community to have available to them. And I think some people will find it surprising, but board games can be quite expensive. Yes, they can. (laughs) Yes, I I feel like uh, it shocked me too as I was looking into it. I'm like, wow, these are really, uh, they've they've hiked. Then again, you know, when I was younger, I wasn't the one buying the board games. Exactly. (laughs) Maybe they were expensive then too, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, so I, uh, you know, I came up with, I did a lot of research into interesting ones. I really did kind of want to mix a little bit of having those traditional ones, but at the same time, I thought um, that maybe traditional ones, you know, such as Monopoly and Clue, uh, those sorts of ones that, you know, a lot of people might own them already. So then I also wanted a good chunk of the collection to be ones that might are newer um, and might be ones that, you know, people have never played before. Mm-hmm. and might not even consider, you know, taking a look at if they didn't have the option for free. Uh, so that's what I did. Um, so most of the games, they range from ages 8 plus, uh, and then I uh, go to 14 plus uh, at the highest age rating, uh, and uh, people are able to check them out for three weeks at a time uh, and renew it if they'd like to as well. Um, And, yeah, I guess I just really wanted to provide something fun. I think uh, in the works, too, we definitely might be looking into pairing it with programming Mm -hmm. as well. Um, At at this time, we have not started it, but we're looking into doing that pairing, maybe like a family game night um, Mm -hmm. along those lines. Uh, And so where you can find them is, uh, if you have checked them out already, you've probably seen them downstairs right by the customer service desk where we have a nice little display. Um, But we have tons more upstairs on the second floor um, right by our oversized nonfiction. So uh, if you're a family looking for some fun games to play together, we've got you covered. Absolutely. Yeah, we've had people check them out and say, you know what, I've got company next week and Mm -hmm. this is a great rainy day or just something uh, fun, a fun activity in the evening. Yeah, Um, actually, um, Melissa, our youth librarian, uh, told us a nice story where uh, a mom came up to her and was like, um, you know, my two kids, they were uh, older, I think 14, and maybe their older uh, child was like 20 or something like that. Um, But they checked out one of our kind of mystery style board games called Chronicles of Crime and it comes actually with three uh, different gameplays that you can use and it's a board game that also involves an app too and they were like they were playing it till like four o'clock in the morning <laughs> playing all the gameplays and they had so much fun mm-hmm. um, and, and we have uh, started getting some suggestions too of board games so again that's something that we include if you are interested in a game you're welcome to request it and if possible we will, we will purchase it yep because there's a whole world of them out there. I've learned so much about board games. (laughs) Yes, yeah. And and again, we're hoping to maybe build it in the future. You know, we'll see how it does, and then hopefully we can expand um, if it remains popular, because so far it is doing quite well. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can can see uh, definitely a sustainability and longevity for that project. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you, Dusty, All so right, much for joining me on this podcast. Uh, And thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and join us again next time on Circulating Conversations.